join me in welcoming our next speaker as we explore some out-of-this-world concepts. Ms. Leila Snella. Snella, really? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, hello everyone, welcome, and it's yeah crazy to be here and do this. Um, so, um, please, raise your hand if you have had any sugar today. Any amount, <laughs> any um, yeah, kind of sugar. So yeah, I can see that most of us have had some kind of sugar and it's no surprise because it's the most commonly found ingredient in the supermarket. Between 50 to 75% of all the products in the supermarket contain some amount of sugar and we all know that it's not that good for us. Can we replace sugar with sensory elements like color, shape, texture, sound or smell. I believe our senses are a free resource that we can use to help, uh, that can help us eat healthier. And I explored this idea as a sensory food designer. Uh, today, my goal is to challenge your understanding of our perception. And I hope to inspire you to think differently about our senses. Our brain uses five senses to understand the world around us. When we touch, taste, smell, see or hear things, our senses send electric impulses to the brain to process and make sense of. As we are multisensory beings, all of our senses work together to create the most accurate perception of the world we live in. As complex as it can be, vision is considered our dominating sense. With vision, we can detect light, dark, color, shape, texture, but also temperature, uh, emotion, distance and space, and, and also, based on vision, we can imagine things that are not there. We understand our vision as an observation of our world. We are born in and we live in this vision. So what else can be there? What our eye picks up is what is called the visible white light. And it's just a fraction of what's out there. There are many uh, anim uh, animal species that can see other wavelengths out of this spectrum, like for example, snakes seeing infrared. Each species living on this planet sees it differently with their own set of tools. We're all living in these perceived realities. Yeah, like for example, like uh, a color, a colorblind person, colorblind person. Uh, might not know that they are colorblind uh, until they maybe stumble upon the color test or maybe somebody else notices a difference in their color perception. We see our surroundings, we see different spaces, we see people, we see different shapes and different colors and different textures. We see each other, we see people, different clothing, uh, we see interiors, spaces, um, food, and so on. And it appears that all of these objects uh, has got this kind of like an identity of their given color. Like for example, like this apple being green. But what is color? Um, even I'm still trying to wrap my head around it sometimes as it doesn't come natural for us to understand, to break down an understanding of something seemingly so obvious. But science explains color as light wavelength reflection that our eye picks up, sends to the brain, that translates it into the names that we have given to different wavelengths, the colors of the rainbow. There are around 15 causes of color, but for example, food and nature is colored by the chemicals in them that can change. 
like a tomato is green at first and it turns red when it ripens. Um, so this visible white light, everything that we see, uh, a Newton's experiment kind of visualizes uh, how it works the best. So we have the visible white, so it's everything that our eye can see and perceive. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a daylight or it's electric light. When the white light uh, shines, it exposes the colors. Uh, the Newton's experiment prism shows how this white light is broken down into all the containing colors. So basically, this what it what it does. This bunch of colors, all the colors we know, the white light hits an object. Uh, the object absorbs almost all the light, almost all the colors, except for green in this case. It doesn't like it for some reason, and it won't let it in. So it reflects it back, our, uh, our brain picks it up and translates into the color we see, green in this case. Victoria Finlay thinks in her book Color as something not being the color, but of it doing the color. But I would consider that it is and does all the other colors and is not the color we see. Without a brain, our world does not contain color. As it does not contain uh, sounds, but sound waves. It also doesn't contain smells, but contains aroma molecules that interact with our nose. And the same goes for tastes. There are no tastes outside in the world, but different taste uh, molecules that fit perfectly with the shapes of our taste, box, uh, taste buds on our tongue. The point is, our experiences are unique and human specific. It is our brain that translates uh, wavelengths into color, uh, vibrations in air into sound that we can hear. We learn what we touch, taste, smell, see, and hear, just as we learn a language. We give meaning to the inputs, just as we... Um, um, yeah, it helps us to navigate with efficiency, as to communicate complex ideas within 15-minute talks. By understanding what and how we learn, we can use perception to make our food healthier. Imagine every time we would see a yellow drink, we would have no idea of what it could taste like. Our brain uses shortcuts between the senses, just like using shorts like LOL, YOLO or BRB to express an idea. Our brain is associating red tones with sweetness and yellow green tones with sourness. All these are learned associations from our past experiences that make our future uh, experiences more predictable. Just by seeing the yellow liquid, we are able to predict if it's a sweet or sour juice, if we can predict the temperature, we can imagine if it's a pineapple or lemon juice. Our brain can predict flavor, taste, temperature only from visual data. Like this color experiment I did during my study. The question was which of these two fruits is sweet and which is sour? And I think most of us can immediately say that the, that the greenish yellow strawberries are sour, but our brain struggles a bit with the red uh, lemon, as it recognizes the shape of the lemon, but the red color takes away another source of information for calling it sour. I thought I'm simply changing the color of these two fruits, but what was obvious later is that any red fruit, almost any red fruit, uh, when it's unripe, it's greenish sour color, and it turns to red when it ripens. And it made it really clear as to where we learn this color association from. Green, yellow tones are unripe, sour, tart, and hard. Red tones are ripe, 
sweet, soft. This guessing is um, something that we can use to design our food. With our food consumption and uh, production damaging our health and environment, we can implement this knowledge in our food design. According to World Health Organization, um, excess weight gain is the key outcome of free sugars intake. To fight the sugar, in 2014, the Mexican government implemented a 10% tax on sh uh, sugary beverages, and it showed positive results. But how would we sweeten our food if the sugar was banned completely? My project, Food on Mars, that I did during my residency in the um, Museum of Tomorrow in Rio, explores how, in an extreme scenario, we could possibly create food diversity with very limited resources. Using spirulina and a wheat as a known possible source of nutrition on Mars, we can shape it into many different uh, inputs using 3D printing technology. Make it round, angular, uh, hollow or flat. A cooking technique uh, gives it an experience of crunchy, soft, chewy, hard. On top of the preparation techniques, we can also uh, add a suitable color, temperature and also sound to make rich and diverse experiences, even though eating more or less the same every day. By looking at such extreme scenarios, um, we can find solutions for existing problems of today or prepare for the future. What if this is how we eat in the future? What if this is how we prepare food and how we grow food in the future? What if this is how we are forced to eat food in the future due to all the lost land and biodiversity? What if we decide to prepare food like this to protect the natural resources and, uh, and food in the future? How do we envision our future? What do we want to see in it and what not? Even though this might not seem right to you, you have found out what you don't want to see in the future and keep defining how you want to see it. Knowing what you don't want is as important as knowing what you want. Imagining and visualizing speculative scenarios is just one of the things a food designer can do. Imagining the future, envisioning the future. Understanding that our senses are electric impulses. Why don't we design for the brain itself, I question. With technological developments like Neuralink, which is an uh, implantable brain-machine interface, can we create the sweetness directly in our brain? What if we have controls on our phone and we can dial up the sweetness or saltiness directly in our brain? Can we create sweet moods for eating our food? Alexa, play sweet. The room turns warm red, a light, soft, pleasant sound starts to play, and a sweet aroma dispenses. An, a round, soft, and pleasant dessert is in front of you, but with no sweeteners in it. I explore these recipes for the brain, preparing for such future of multisensory food and brand experiences. Until then, we can understand and uh, apply many of the findings and experiments of neurogastronomy. We can start small by using the roundest, uh, the roundest and the warmest color cup uh, for our tea or coffee to increase the perception of the sweetness. We can play a s pleasant sound for our dessert or add a red coloring to your water or yogurt and use a free, available and sustainable resource as your own senses. Thank you.